Well, good evening, Calvary family. We're excited wherever you may be joining us from, whether it's home, work, school, whatever it may be that you are, wherever you may be at right now, we are excited that you're joining us this evening for a time of worship and a continual time of study in Colossians. But as we begin tonight, why don't we just start an opening up in prayer, and then we're just going to have a moment of kind of silence to just settle our hearts. This time is very busy, very crazy. Uh, maybe you have kids in the house that normally you wouldn't have all day, every day. Maybe you've been bringing all your work home. I know many who I've talked to who are working from home are saying, you know, it kind of seems like I never stop working now because all my work is at home. I could be working at 10 o'clock at night some nights instead of that boundary between home and work. And so I pray that this evening as we begin here, you would be able to settle your hearts before God. You'd be able to lay away all the distractions, and you'd be able to worship him in all glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this evening that we get to come and worship you. And I pray that as we begin with worship, Lord, that your presence would fill our hearts, would fill the spaces that we are in right now. Though separate, Lord, you can fill each and every one of the spaces. So, Lord, make your presence known this evening in the lives of those who are viewing, who are partaking in church this evening. Lord, we ask that the distractions of our home environments be lifted from uh, our ears and our eyes, and Lord, we just be able to focus fully in on who you are. Because when you speak, you scatter darkness. And Lord, there is much darkness around us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we begin, let's just take a moment and settle our hearts. Maybe do some breathing and get some big exhales and inhales in as we start. to the darkness You're the only right among the wrongs You're the only hope among the chaos You are the voice that calls me on Louder than every lie My sword in every fight The truth will chase away Deny. Your name is power over darkness, freedom for the captives, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle, mighty, he won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power. I know that it's written, love is certain. I know the word will never fail. I know that in every situation, you speak the power to prevail. Louder than every lie, my sword in every fight, the truth will chase away. The night, your name is power over darkness, freedom for the captives, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle, mighty, you won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power. When you speak, you scatter darkness. Light arrives in heaven, opens. Holy Spirit, 
let us hear it. When you speak, the church awakens. We believe that change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. Lift it up. When you speak, you scatter darkness. Light arrives in heaven, opens. Holy Spirit, let us hear it. When you speak, the church awakens. We believe that change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. Your name is power over darkness. Freedom for the captives. Mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle. Glory in the struggle. Mighty, he will let us down or fail us. Your name is power. Your name is power. and shake and crumble at your name yes Lord the oceans roar and tumble at your name the angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out cry out church Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord, at your name, the morning breaks in glory. Your name, oh, creation sings your story. At your name, the angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name. Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. There is no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God, we will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God, we will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God, we will praise you, praise you. Jesus, you are God, we will sing. Lord of all the earth, we Shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with Endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord.
When my heart is weary, when my soul is weak, when it seems I can't traverse the trail before me, I survey the glory of your agony, and I find the will to fight for what's before me. Cause you ran the race, enduring for your glory. And I fix my eyes on you. The founder and the finisher of our faith. And I fix my eyes on you. The solace in your suffering is my strength. As I fight to follow, you're my righteous guide. And you train me to delight in all that's holy. You're my broken body. You're my crooked stride. Throw off every weight and sin that clings so closely. I will run the race, enduring for your glory. And I fix my eyes on you, Jesus, the founder and the finisher of our faith. And I fix The solace in your suffering is my strength. You help me breathe. You're the only life I need. You died for me. You're the only life I need. You help me breathe. You're the only life I need. You died for me. You're the only life I Yeah. 
created one Jesus your name is like honey on my lips your spirit like water to my soul your word is a lamp on to my feet Jesus I love you I love you your name is like honey on my lips your spirit like water to my soul your word is a lamp on to my feet Jesus, I love you, I love you. set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of oh, when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever i could sing of your love forever and though i feel like dancing it's foolishness i know when the world has seen the light they will dance for joy like we're dancing now i could sing of your love forever 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 I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever.
forever, Lord, will we sing of your love. There's nowhere that we can hide that your love can't find us. There's nowhere we can hide that you can't see us. And Lord, and it's in humble submission this evening, Lord, that I give you control. Thankful as we just celebrated Easter and Good Friday and Palm Sunday of your willing sacrifice for my soul. I have been bought with a price, a love so great no one could match, but also a price so high cost you your life. And so I will dance. I will dance in the love and the power that is your spirit. I will dance in the glory that is your majesty. Singing, I could sing of your love forever. May we never grow tired of that truth, of that promise. And as we, be, we begin our study this evening, Lord, would your scripture come alive to us. As many would call it, the 66 book love letter. Because it's filled with your love for us. We thank you for this evening and the opportunity to get to worship your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good evening. Glad to have you see me. I'm looking forward to seeing you soon. This evening, we will be in Colossians chapter 3. and We're going to cover a big section, verses 1 through 17. The theme or the idea that we see throughout this section is for you and I to be heavenly minded, to be minded about heaven and let that influence our behavior. And it's appropriate, especially in the midst of all that we've got going on, that it is so easy for us to just be bombarded with negativity or news that just seems to wear you down. I'm not saying you can't watch the news. I'm saying you and I need to be heavenly minded. And if the coronavirus wasn't happening, we would still need to be on guard because we live in a world that is contrary to God. And so we're called here in this passage to set our minds on heaven. And as we look at this passage, Colossians chapter 3, we'll start here in verse 1 in just a moment, but remind you about chapter 2. First of all, chapter 2, the first half was put on or embrace Christ, not human wisdom. And then it was embrace Christ, not man's system to approach God or legalism. Here we're called to put on Christ or embrace Christ instead of what we see in the world all around us. So I want to remind you that you can join us, of course, wherever you're joining us, you're joining us. And please share with others, whether it be on Facebook Live or on the church's website. We'd love to have your interaction. Uh, on the church's website, you can submit prayer requests. Uh, there's other ways to interact with that, so explore some of those things. Uh, there should be a section for some notes for you as well. And then if you're on Facebook, of course, you can interact with us, uh, leaving comments, or you can email the church, info at ccgarland.com. And we want to assure you two things. Okay, three things. One, Jesus Christ loves you. Absolutely. We, as a church, love you. And then third, if you have needs, we want to be able to pray with you for those needs. We have a food pantry. We got the bread. Uh, if there's other things that you need, if you need somebody to pick up items for you at the store, reach out to the body so that we might be able to minister one to another. But let's pray as we dive into God's word this evening. Father, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I ask by your Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate this word to us. Make it real to us that we might be able to live it out. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to cover, Lord willing, verses 1 through 17. What I want to do is read verses 1 through 4 for you, and then come back and talk about those. 
So Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you are were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, seated, uh, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Boy, uh, I almost feel like going off of my notes and just spending the entire time on just those four verses. I'm not going to do that, but there's so much depth in there. And I'm just acknowledging to you that there's more depth in there than what I'm going to actually cover this evening. But Paul begins this section as he focuses our practical Christian living on how we live out our lives. But remember this, practical Christian living is built on the foundation of practical theological thinking. Theological, sometimes that's a word that intimidates us. Theo is the word for God. Logic is the idea of to ponder or to think about it. So Theological just simply means thoughts and ideas regarding God. You need to have a right idea about God for that to influence your practical life. Your theology or your thinking about God ought to influence how you behave. And let me say this. If your behavior is off, is your theology right? It is not sufficient to have right theology but then ungodly behavior. Our behavior needs to follow and flow from our theology. Now, you might have right thinking about God, but you've got to allow it to go from our minds, that marvelous 18 inches into our hearts, so that it impacts how we live. And so he has been giving us, chapter 1, Christ is supreme. Chapter 2, don't rely upon uh, the philosophy of mankind, but rely upon Christ. The last part of chapter 2 is don't rely upon man's wisdom or legalism, but rely upon Christ. And here he's saying, let your theology, let your reliance upon Christ influence your practical behavior. Since you and I as believers are not only dead, but have been raised with Christ. You see, when we partake in that act of baptism, what we're saying in a a physical or actually more of a spiritual sense is that as we go down under that water, we're saying, I'm dying to myself, my flesh, my selfish ambitions, all the things that have ruled my life. And I'm being raised up out of that water into a new life where I am no longer being influenced by the world around me. I'm no longer listening to my own fleshly desires. Instead, now I'm listening to the voice of Christ. And if you're listening to the voice of Christ, your behavior will change. So that believers' lives, your life, my life, needs to be dominated by the pattern of heaven. Bringing heavenly direction into our daily lives, even the mundane things of lives. You see, we're called to fix our attention directly towards the things above. How would Jesus do this? What's the attitude God would have towards us? Am I representing God in this situation? That's the attitude and the mindset we need to have on a daily basis as we walk with Christ. We need to be a people who are born again. And because of this born again experience with God, it has impacted our lives. Recall with me, if you would. In the book of Acts, the early church as it was beginning to be established, what did the other people who weren't Christians say about them? They knew they were distinctive or there was something different about them because of their love. Not they had all the theology right, not that they had this thing or that thing right, but of their love. And may that mark our lives. May we be moved with compassion towards others especially in the midst of this coronavirus. May we reach out to neighbors and to friends, whether that's knocking on somebody's door or sending a text or an email, but may we be motivated out of love. May we pray for one another because we feel compassion for them, because we have a measure of the love of Christ in our hearts 
that we therefore want to reach out to them. Why do we share the gospel? Because the love of Christ compels us. Why, do, why is it throughout human history, well, since the establishment of the church, let's put it that way, orphanages, hospitals have been established in regions of the world where there is nothing like that by who? By Christians. Christians have reached out. Christians have been motivated by a love for God to attend to the practical needs, maybe digging a well for clean water. Maybe it's setting up a hospital or an orphanage to care for those that are sick or those that have been abandoned by family. But Christians have been motivated, and as they did this, they also came along to share the gospel. I don't know if you've followed the news, but Samaritan's Purse in New York City has set up a field hospital in Central Park. They set up a field hospital just like they do when they go into Africa. They did this during the Ebola crisis. They went into Africa. They brought tents. They brought supplies. They brought uh, trained doctors and nurses to minister to the practical needs. <laughs> but you know what some of those who are opposed to Christianity questioned? What are the motivations of Samaritan's Purse? What's the motivations of Franklin Gamp? Graham, because Franklin Graham and Samaritan's Purse, for those that are on staff, they have to agree to their basic uh, doctrinal statement. There is but one God, Jesus Christ. Salvation is through him. Basic things like that. Now, they treat anybody who will come in, but those who work there need to be born-again Christians. And of course, they want to treat the practical needs, and when God gives them opportunities, they want to minister to the spiritual needs. In the midst of the coronavirus, they are putting themselves into harm's way to reach out to people in need. And of course, those who are opposed to Christ are flipping out over it. Because maybe somebody would be healed of the coronavirus and be healed for eternity. And we can't have that. What hypocrisy in the world around us at a time when the city of New York is crying out, begging for supplies, and yet they're refusing supplies from a Christian organization. But that heart that Samaritan's Purse has is the same heart we've seen throughout the church. You go to many parts of the world, hospitals are named after Christian doctors and denominations. <laughs> Just look around our area. Presbyterian, Christian denomination. Baylor, again, a Christian denomination, have established these hospitals to minister to people's needs. Now, many of those organizations today are far from the original intention of those founders. But may we be careful to follow through in this love of Christ, to minister to practical needs, and also to share the gospel with others. So set your mind on the things which are above. And I've got a list here for you of how we can help to set our minds on the things of God. Things like what you're doing right now, but specifically and outside of Wednesdays and Sundays. Remember, you personally need to spend time in God's word. So as you spend time in God's word, it helps you set your mind on heavenly things. So I urge you to spend time in God's word. Wednesdays, Wednesdays, excuse me, Wednesdays and Tuesdays and Sundays, we have an online Bible study for you, but also throughout your week on a daily basis, seek to spend time in God's word by spending time in prayer, please a little bit more. And if it needs to start here, start here, but thank God for your food every day, not just your dinner meal, but every time you sit down to eat, would you pause to thank God for that food. And I have a second request. Would you ask God to bless Calvary Chapel Garland? And that might mean for most of us three times a day that you would pray and say, God, thank you for this food. God, would you bless Calvary Chapel Garland? And then Lord, would you bless my family, my coworkers, my neighbors, whatever else might come to mind, but spend time in prayer. Now, of course, when I say spend time in prayer, I'm referring more to than just the 30 seconds before you eat. But spend some time specifically praying for the needs of others. On Thursday morning, tomorrow morning, we'll send out an email list. And if you're not on that list, let us know that so you could receive that prayer request. So on Thursdays, we send out not only a church update, 
but then also a prayer request. Two different emails. And if you're not receiving either one of them, check your spam folder and then also let us know so we make sure your email address is on both of those lists. So spend time in prayer. And then also spend time by doing the things that build us up in God instead of looking merely for entertainment. Now you can search Netflix and Hulu or whoever else to your heart's content to watch movies and entertainments and stuff like that. But that's why we sent out to you the invitation for Right Now Media. That especially at this time when many of you are quarantined, that you could again begin to feed your soul through biblical instruction that you'll find on Right Now Media. Now, it's, it has all kinds of topics, biblical studies, things that are targeted for children, through adolescents, those who are married, those who are single, men, women, apologetics. There's all kinds of categories, and I urge you to look at that as an opportunity to feed your soul. It's not a replacement for your own personal Bible study. It's not a replacement for gathering as a church body. It's an additional resource to help you grow in your walk in Jesus Christ. And then fourthly, by gathering with others in the Lord. Now you might say, wait a minute, what about social distancing? Right now, you can say hello to whoever else is online with you by entering into that chat or that comment section. Women, Friday night, you will have a Zoom Bible study. And if you have, you download the Zoom app. And again, if you didn't get an invite, let us know. We'll make sure that an email invite is sent to you. And when you click on that, you'll be able to see the faces of other ladies. And so we encourage you in the midst of the social distancing to continue to reach out. Men, we're doing the same thing on Saturday mornings at 830. Again, if you didn't receive an email with the link for the Zoom meeting, please let us know so that we can make sure that you're included. We want you to be included. It allows you to do video conferencing so you get to see the pictures of everyone else that's online at the same time. Is it a replacement for gathering in person? No, but it is a way for us to continue to interact with others in the Lord. And of course, you can do that via texting, email, phone calling, and things like that. But it's important for us to remember to reach out and to be encouragers and to be encouraged by others around us. And so this is what God wants us to do as we set our mind on the things of Christ or that we're heavenly minded. Now let's look at verses five through seven. Therefore, put to death. Therefore, why is it therefore? Because we're to set our mind on heavenly things. Therefore, put to death your members which were on the earth. Your members. Now it's not talking about cutting your arm off. What it is, is no longer feed your flesh. And it gives us a list of things. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Okay? Before you were a Christian, maybe you were a goody two shoe, maybe you were really close to Satan or somewhere in between. It doesn't matter. Today, if you are a born-again Christian, you're to put off your old lifestyle. And it gives us a list of very specific things that we're to put off. Uh, the issue of fornication, uncleanness, passion, I, is the idea, uh, evil desires. These are all sexual terms. Maybe your life before Christ was ruled by sexual passions. For some, you never acted on it, but every thought was about sexual activity. Or others, you acted upon it. And as a born-again Christian, that is no longer to be the rule of your life. You're no longer to be having that as the rule or the passion, the drive of your life. Instead, we're to consider one another not as sexual objects, but as individuals that Christ died for. And he has a passion for them. And he wants to see them grow. And we need to have that same Christ-like attitude. Nobody is just an object for us to use. Maybe in a sexual way or maybe just somebody to get a job done. Instead, may we be people filled with the compassion of Christ. And then it goes on and it says this word covetousness. 
And here I got another definition for you. Covetousness is simple. It's the insidious greed. It's an unsensationable desire for something that's not yours. It's nothing less than idolatry. Why? Idolatry is worshiping or following something other than God himself. When you covet, let's say for an example, uh, whatever example I use, I know I'm going to get somebody upset. But let's say you covet a new fancy cell phone. And you're doing everything you can to get that new cell phone. You're, you're devising all kinds of ways and you're figuring out how to break your phone so you can get the insurance money for your phone or whatever it might be. Then that cell phone has become your God because you're doing everything for that cell phone. That's covetousness, which is idolatry. Instead, we are to put on, we're to be heavenly minded. If God blesses you with a brand new cell phone, wonderful, but don't let that cell phone be what rules your life or social media or entertainment or possession. Instead, what we need to do is be filled with a passion for Christ first and foremost. And it tells us that the wrath of God is coming to those who are sons of disobedience. What a terrible thing. Notice we all lived in this, this way, but you and I have been redeemed or set free. Verse 8, but now you yourselves are to put off these. Put off what? Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. Filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man with his deeds, but have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Now notice it uses this term multiple times, a put off and put on. And the best way to describe that is the idea of putting on or putting off clothing. It's the idea that you would maybe... You spent the day out working in the yard and you're just covered with grass or with dirt or sweat, whatever else. And you take off those dirty clothes and you go get a shower or a bath. That's one aspect. You put off the old, but then it's like you're getting dressed for, say, a wedding. You don't show up in the wedding and in your grubby jeans and your sweaty T-shirt. Instead, you put them off, take a shower, and then you put on some nicer clothes. And that's the same analogy that Paul is using here. Put off these fleshly controlled thoughts and ideas and actions, but put on the ideas and the thoughts and actions of Christ. It's a simple term, but in reality, it's hard to do. So put off is the idea of no longer participate in those things. It's the idea that we must rid ourselves Get rid of it. I remember years ago, my first job was at a fish and chips restaurant. I was one of the fry cooks. In our particular case, the fish didn't come in frozen and battered. We, we actually thawed the fish out. We battered it individually, and then we fried it in the fryer. So I smelled every day after work like fish and like grease. And when I quit that job and got a different job, I had a pair of shoes that were coated with fish guts and grease. And guess what I did with them? <laughs> I threw them in the trash. I put off them because they were disgusting. Matter of fact, I was still living at home at the time and my mother wouldn't let me come in the house with my shoes on because they were filthy and stinky. May you do the same thing in the ungodly behavior. Throw it off. Put it off. Get rid of it. And that's the idea here. Now, he lists a couple of things for us here to put off. To not have anything to do with anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. So, let's talk about anger for a moment. Anger is this chronic smoldering attitude. It's the idea that sometimes we, we, we say, well, that's just a, a grumpy old man. Somebody who has a smoldering anger in his life. That he's never happy with something. Something's always wrong. 
It's sort of this just under the surface. And then rage is this outburst or this acute outburst of this anger. So the idea is a person, man or woman, who's just unsettled, not content before the Lord. And it's sort of this smoldering fire within them. And then an incident happens, and then outpours this outburst of wrath or rage, outburst of anger, where we just puke on somebody. We're to put both of those. It's not enough just to control your tongue at that moment of rage, but your anger needs to be replaced with the love of Jesus Christ. So we're called to put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, speaking evil of others, filthy language, cussing, or language that has a double innuendo. In our culture, there's lots of things where we say things, but the root of the word is something just gross. And we're to put that aside because we're to have biblical language or the language of Christ. Now, I'm not saying you have to speak Victorian English and King James English or NIV English. What I'm saying is our words need to be words that are uplifting and encouraging to others, not tearing them down. Verse 9, do not lie to one another since you've put off the old man. Don't lie to each other. Don't say you're going to do something when you have no idea or no intention of doing it. That's what we did before we were Christians. We were always looking out for ourselves. And here as Christians, we are to put Christ first in all things. Because like a dirty, sweaty, disgusting shoes, you take them off. So take off or put off wrath, anger, malice, and lying to one another. Verse 10, and having put on the new man who is renewed in the knowledge. So put on, put away those old, dirty, filthy sneakers and put on a nice pair of shoes. That's the idea here. Put off the junk of this world and put on a new nature. Because you are a new person, a new man. Now, it's not gender specific. It's man in the sense of mankind because you are a new creation in Christ because you have accepted Christ into your heart. You are now a new person. If you are born again, you have a brand new heart. Your heart has been transformed. Let it out. Let it be shown to others around you. And that's the idea. Again, this idea of putting on a new clothes is the same idea again that we talked about. It's like you changed clothes. If you're going out on a date, I know we're not going out on dates right now, but if you were, wouldn't you get changed? Wouldn't you take a shower? Wouldn't you put on a nice set of clothes and put aside the sweatpants that have mustard stains on them or whatever else? That's the idea. Just like you and I, practical issues would change our clothes depending on the events. So it is in our lives, biblically speaking. May we put on Christ. May we represent Christ to all who are around us. That we would be renewed, having put on the new man who's renewed, changed. I think of Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that we would be renewed. Our minds would be renewed in our relationship with Jesus Christ. That I would begin to think differently. Now, do we struggle with the old man, our flesh? Absolutely. So here's the idea. Say somebody cuts you off in traffic and your old way was to get angry with them, flip them off and cut them off. Well, here's what God wants you to do. They, they cut in front of you. You begin to get angry. and You say, no, wait a minute. God, I wanted you to change my attitude. And so I'm just going to let it go. I'm not going to flip them off. I'm not going to cut them off in revenge. Instead, God... Thank you that you are beginning to change my heart. And then you would do that on a regular basis. Let God change you from the inside and let it reflect on how you live your life. You see, you and I were created in the image of God. When God created us back in Genesis, we were created in the image of God. But you and I have also been the object of satanic hatred satan hates you and he has been doing everything he can to trip you up to pollute you 
Satan wants to deface that image, this wonderful image that God has created you in, Satan wants to distort it. He wants to tag it, make it look horrible. He wants you to live in rebellion and to degrade you. And even though we have all experienced the attacks of Satan, he will not be victorious. If you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, Satan is not victorious in your life. God has a definite plan to restore his image in you. Yes, you. Whatever your list of things that you have done wrong or ideas that you had that are unbiblical, God wants to redeem you and to make you into his image. That your thoughts would be like God's thoughts. That your heart attitude would be like God's heart attitude. And then that your actions would be like God's. So to be heavenly minded has this idea that my actions represent Christ. Maybe it's driving. <laughs> Maybe with this coronavirus and this stay at home order, now you've grown tired and weary of your family. You're beginning to irritate one another. Little things. So what do you do? Do you kick everyone else out of the house? Do you go move into the backyard? Or do you ask Jesus Christ to transform your attitude? Lord, give me the patience of Christ. Lord, let me see the good in this other person. Lord, you died for them. And I really believe they're a dirty, rotten scoundrel. But Christ, yet you died for them. And so would you give me a measure of your love for them? I would say this to you. Would you pray for your family members? Whoever is irritating you, would you pray for them? Pray that God would bless them. And you'll be amazed at how your own personal attitude begins to change as you pray for God's blessing in somebody else's life. And as God blesses them, they become more Christ-like and the way that they behave and interact with you begins to be changed. And that's a glorious, wonderful thing to have God change us and transform us. And I'm, that's what Paul's talking about here in Colossians chapter 3. That as we fix our minds on heaven, God changes us so that we are transformed in the image of God. So as we put on this new self, this new person in Christ, notice what it says here. As we've put on this new person created in Christ, verse 11, whether there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and all. Now, this is a powerful passage that we need for all of our lives. Notice what he draws out here. As part of this new family of God, because of our faith relationship in Jesus Christ, there now is no longer favoritism based on our race, our ethnicity, our nationality, our class, our culture, or anything else. Only Jesus Christ is the influence. So no longer do we look at one another based on the color of our skin or what language we speak or, or economic background or education background. Because Christ died for us all. There is no room in Jesus Christ for racism, for bigotry. There's no room for that. Because Christ died for us all. Now notice, Greek and Jew was a religious distinction. Jews were those that were descendants of Abraham and Isaac. And Jews thought of anybody outside the Jewish faith, and more specifically outside the practicing customs of Judaism as a Greek. And so a Jewish person abhorred, disliked anybody that wasn't part of their personal tradition, part of their nation. And there was religious distinctions. Notice here, circumcised or uncircumcised. In our vernacular today, it should be, it doesn't matter whether you are Baptist or Lutheran or what denomination you came from or how you came to Christ. The issue is, do you know Christ? And even for those who don't know Christ, we are not allowed to have an attitude of superiority. 
I like this idea that I've heard many times before. As a Christian, you and I are simply beggars. We're beggars who happen to find a wonderful resource for life and godliness, and that's found in Jesus Christ. So just because one person found that resource for life and godliness before somebody else doesn't make them any better. We are all beggars. And so we all need more of Jesus in our life. But whether it's religious distinctions, cultural distinctions, many uh, who were Greek, there's, there were Greeks that were in the Greek um, or Roman culture, but then there were those outside of the Roman influence who were considered barbarians. And they, the word barbarians simply comes from the idea that they couldn't understand their language, and so they called them barbarians. Uh, or Scythians. Scythians were considered a wild or savage or tribal nomadic people. And you see, in God's economy, it doesn't matter what their background is, whether they were well-educated or uneducated whether they came from this continent or that continent, whether they came from a metropolitan city or a small village in the rural outskirts of a country far away. It doesn't matter because we're all one in Christ. And one of the wonderful things, for those of you who've had the opportunity to travel to some places of the world that's less developed, less economically advantaged as we are here in the United States, it's wonderful to be able to go into a small village where they perhaps have no running water or maybe no cooking uh, ovens. Instead, they cook over an open flame, maybe no sewage, and yet to find people that are deeply in love with Jesus. You see, it's not about whether you have a, a gas stove or an electric stove. It's about do you love Jesus? It's not about whether you have indoor or outdoor plumbing or no plumbing. It's about, do you love Jesus? Now, I greatly appreciate our indoor plumbing, but that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is, do you know who Jesus is? And has he so influenced your life that others know about it? And that's what he's talking about here. You see, all these natural barriers are destroyed, broken down in a relationship with Jesus Christ because we are all created equal in the eyes of God. And as this new person in Christ, we're to walk in this. Because you have a new character, a new person in Jesus Christ, you're called to walk in that. Let's look at verses 12 through 17. Therefore, because you have a new person who put on the mind of Christ, put off the, the mind of the world, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, Put on, now here's what we are to do. Put on tender mercies. Now that put on is the same as changing clothes. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, Put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, for which also you were called in one body, and to be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. That is what we are called to do. Now, notice this. this I just want to park for a moment on this issue of forgiveness, because many times in our lives, we deal with this issue of unforgiveness. Maybe you have been somebody who... Uh, who misused somebody else, and you need to ask them for forgiveness. You've been the abuser, maybe verbally, emotionally, physically, financially. Or maybe you've been the victim, and the world around us tells us to hold on to unforgiveness. But the Bible is quite clear that you and I 
or to extend forgiveness towards others. And by what measure? By the measure of Christ. How willingly and freely Christ has forgiven me. So a couple of thoughts on this issue of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a promise made in response to repentance. Now, for a restored relationship to happen, let's think about you and God for a moment. For a restored relationship, the offer to be forgiven is already there by God. God has said to you and to me, I offer to forgive you, but we're not reconciled or brought into a friendship until I repent. So in other words, if I say, would you please forgive me, but I keep slapping you in the face, you can say, you need to repent, Dwayne. But notice there's still an offer of forgiveness from God. So it is in our human relationships. We, if we are the victim need to be willing to extend forgiveness towards somebody else. You might say, but what if they never repent? That's a valid question. We are still called to forgive them, although our relationship hasn't been restored. And there's a big difference between that. Somebody's been slapping you around. You can forgive them, but it doesn't mean you have to continue to be a victim. You don't have to continue to be slapped around or have somebody continuously taking advantage of you. You can take yourself out of that situation so that you're not continuously being beaten or taken advantage of, but you're still called to have a heart of forgiveness. You see, forgiving one another, whoever has a complaint, specifically amongst Christians, but also outside the world. You see, this promise of forgiveness is the pattern of Christ forgiveness. Notice, when did Jesus decide to forgive you? Long before you ever had an idea that you were a sinner and needed to be forgiven. Long before you even recognized your own wrong, Christ was willing to forgive you. Now again, that forgiveness wasn't complete until you repented and recognized your need. And so what happens, you might ask, it's a valid question. What happens when the uh, offending party is unrepentant? (laughs) As an example, in our relationship with God. If somebody says, even though God extends forgiveness, I don't want to be forgiven. And I don't care. I don't think anything I've ever done is wrong. Then they suffer the consequence of their sin, ultimately to spend eternity in hell. You say, okay, Dwayne, that makes great sense. Biblically, in eternity. But what do I do with my brother, my sister, my friend, my ex-friend, who hasn't? extended or sought repentance how do i do that so the offending party if the offending party is unrepentant it does no good for the offended one to hold on so you've been the victim you've been offended but it does you no good to hold on to that as if you're holding it over them because the unrepentant person is living life as if you didn't exist don't hold on to that hurt or that bitterness Turn that hurt and that bitterness over to Jesus. Jesus, you died to take away my pain. You died to take away my suffering. My iniquity that has been poured out on me. Jesus, you know even better. And Jesus, I find peace and comfort in you. Even if true forgiveness and reconciliation cannot be made because the offending party is unwilling to repent... If you have been offended, you need to still let go of that. Now, that forgiveness is not complete. The the relationship is not restored unless they're willing to repent. But don't hold on to it. Don't let anger and bitterness rule your lives. Instead, put that off. Malice, anger, wrath. And put on the love and the peace of Jesus Christ. Is it unfair? Yes, it is. But it was unfair for Jesus to pay the penalty for my sin. And he definitely paid the penalty for my sin. So it wasn't fair for Jesus to do what he did for me. But I'm so thankful that he did. And as a Christian whose heart is being molded into the image of Christ, I need to extend to others the forgiveness that Christ has first extended to me. Is it hard? Is it difficult? Yes. But with God, all things are possible. 
Remember this. We just celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday. Christ rose from the grave. It's a marvelous thing. It was a miracle. It was something that was impossible in human terms. As you turn over to God, there is nothing impossible with God. God can give you a heart of compassion towards that jerk who offended you. Maybe it's something as simple as somebody cutting you off on the freeway. Maybe it's something much more significant than that broken trust. But God is able to restore. Allow God to restore your own life and your own walk with him. And as you do that, you can let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. We're called to admonish one another. May we do that in Jesus' precious name. Father, I thank you for this time for us to be together. Father, I thank you for those that are running the technology, for Rebecca doing the sign language. Thank you for Taylor leading us in worship. Thank you for the technology that allows us to come into kitchens and living rooms and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And Father, as we endure this social distancing, may you work in each of our lives to enable us to put on Christ that we might be heavenly minded. And because we're heavenly minded, it would influence the way that we behave and interact with one another. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you. When you speak, you scatter darkness. Light arrives in heaven, opens. Holy Spirit, let us hear it. When you speak, the church awakens. We believe that change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. Come on! When you speak, you scatter darkness. Light arrives in heaven, opens. Holy Spirit, let us hear it. When you speak, the church awakens. We believe that change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. Your name is power over darkness. Freedom for the captives. Mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle. Mighty, it won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power over darkness, freedom for the captives, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle. Mighty, it won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we tune out for the evening, Lord, I pray that it would be your power that emboldens us to pray for our family and our friends and our co-workers? Would it be your power that gives us patience with our friends and family, our children, our spouses? Lord, because when you speak, the church awakens. I want to be empowered with that power. Lord, no better time than even this moment to commit ourselves to that to commit ourselves to following and trying to follow in your spirit we thank you for this evening and for the opportunity to get to worship and to study through your word would it be a blessing to everyone whose ears this falls on
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, y'all have a wonderful evening, and we will see you guys on Sunday for our regular service. Good evening.